Welcome to video number one of Vue.js Simplified. In this series, we're going to walk through working with the JavaScript framework Vue.js. Along the way, we're going to learn by doing. So we're going to put together this application I'm calling FlashWord. It's a, a game or a practice utility for learning vocabulary in a different language. So you can see you're presented with a series of words and you're tasked with uh, typing in the translation. And if you get it correct, it turns green. Uh, it keeps track of how many words you've guessed correct. You can reset it. And we could also imagine how we expand this, uh, perhaps a way to like shuffle the words or pin words that uh, you're having a hard time with, you want to focus on. Uh, maybe we could adapt it to pull in different languages. There's lots of fun things we could do with this. And so this, uh, like I said, will be our example that will uh, guide us on this journey to learning about Vue.js. Uh, now, in this first video, before we get into writing any Vue.js, I want to talk a bit about what Vue.js is and why you might want to use it. And to do that, we really have to contextualize things. We have to talk about uh, the technologies that come together to make websites. And to have this discussion, I have this diagram here. You can think of this as like all the puzzle pieces that go into websites. And I want to look at the flow of how websites are delivered and how those technologies work together to make it happen. So starting here with the browser itself, of course, this is the, the tool in which we view websites. So a user might type in a URL for our site or follow a link to our site. And when they do that, a request is made to our server that is hosting that site. And the server is going to do whatever processing it needs to do to respond to that request. Um, and it might be as simple as just pulling up an HTML file that's on a server and returning it. Uh, or it might be dynamically pulling together content from, say, a database, merging that in within a, a template of some sort, and that gets returned. Regardless of how it's doing it, it's going to return some response. And typically that response is, at minimum, going to contain HTML and CSS. So of course, HTML is going to be the structure of the page. It's going to say, okay, here's the heading, here's the navigation, here's some links, here's an image. It's going to lay all of that out. And then layered on top of that, we'll have CSS for the style that's going to dictate how things look. And with that, everything I just described is the ingredients for a very classic and traditional website where we go to a URL, the server processes it, a response is returned, the browser will then render that response. And to the extent we continue to interact with that site, say we click links to go to different pages on that site, that whole process will happen again, where we make a full request to the server, the server will generate a response, and then we'll see that response re-rendered in the browser. To visualize a real world example of this, I always like to pull up Wikipedia, just because it's such a classic website in that it's, you know, it's not this bells and whistles interactive site. It's mostly just like text and images and information. And we can browse around this site. We can, you know, click links and jump from page to page. And every time we're doing that, that cycle of talking to the server to regenerate the page is happening. We're, we're seeing that round trip request to the server. And that process or that model works really well for something like Wikipedia because, uh, you know, it's content based. We're basically presented with information and it's not a big deal if we click a link to have to wait for that entire page re to refresh to show us uh, the information that we've requested. All right, now compare that though to something much more dynamic, something like Google Docs. When I first go to a Google Docs link, we are gonna see that initial request to the server where the server is gonna generate our response that's gonna get returned and rendered by the browser. But then after that point, it's gonna be listening for micro interactions. For example, if I start to type some text behind the scenes, it's gonna be automatically saving my changes as I'm working. Uh, if I have a typo in my text, it's going to detect that and via the interface, it's going to let me know. So visually, it's going to indicate that with this little red squiggly line. We get this little pop up for handling uh, the spell checking of that. Basically, anything we might do in this interface, it's all just about these micro interactions. And all of that is happening and powered by the third layer that we see in our client side technologies, which is, of course, JavaScript. JavaScript allows us to create dynamic websites because it gives us a way to manipulate the HTML and the CSS on the page on the fly in reaction to actions from the user. And because we can do that, because we can manipulate the content dynamically, we don't have to rely on that classic model of if we want to see new content, we have to make a whole new request to the server. The server has to return a whole new response that then has to be rendered. Instead, we can shift the responsibility to JavaScript and what's happening in the browser to react to what the user is doing. Now, this doesn't mean that when we shift the responsibility to JavaScript that we don't 
need the server as much anymore because there's still many things um, within web applications that rely upon the server. Things like communicating with a database, uh, talking to third-party merchants if you're doing like monetary transactions. There's many things that the server has to do that we can't do in the client alone with these three technologies. But when that happens, we have a way in JavaScript to communicate with the server. We can send these micro requests to the server that says, hey, get this information from the database or send this email or process this credit card transaction. And then the server, rather than responding with a full page response, can just give us back micro responses that JavaScript can then use to update the interface accordingly, letting the visitor know that their action was successful. All right, so long story short, if you want a very interactive experience, you want you want your website to feel like an application, you're going to be relying heavily on JavaScript. And you could sit down and build your interface using just HTML, CSS, and pure vanilla JavaScript. But you'd spend a lot of time engineering how to do things, right? How to update the interface in the most efficient way. How to manage the interconnected data that is part of your application. You'd have to come up with clear strategies for doing this. Or alternatively, you can pull in a JavaScript framework like Vue.js, which is basically going to give you a pre-existing set of tools for handling all the things you need to do in your interface. And all of this is actually how frameworks like Vue.js evolved. If you look at its uh, predecessors, things like Angular or React, they came out of companies uh, like Google and Facebook, respectively, where you had developers that were starting to build these really robust web interfaces. And they basically said there's got to be a better way where we can streamline this process. Let's put together some tools that handle the common things we need to do on these applications. And that way, as we build more applications, uh, expand our current applications, we could put those tools to use and basically avoid having to reinvent the wheel each time. And of course, because these frameworks are open source and, and freely available to use, then us as individual developers also don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can put these existing tools to use. All right, so that's the role of a JavaScript framework, to give us some tools to solve common problems and uh, things we need to do within our interfaces. Now, I just mentioned Angular. I mentioned React. I've talked about them as uh, predecessors to Vue.js. I do want to talk a little bit about um, you know, why Vue.js versus something like Angular or React. And my goal here is not to make a case to try to say that Vue.js is the best framework um, because that's something that it depends on so many factors. It depends on personal opinion. Uh, each of the frameworks has their own pros and cons. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to focus on some of Vue's common pros or selling points, starting with the fact that it's approachable. Um, relative to a lot of other JavaScript frameworks, I find Vue.js to be more beginner friendly. That being said, and as noted here, it's powerful enough to grow. All right, so it's really good and easy to get started off with. But uh, if your application scales up, the needs of your application scales up, Vue can definitely meet those demands. Uh, it's also versatile. So if you're in a situation where let's say you have an existing uh, application or website, it's more in the long the lines of like a traditional website where you're doing this full page request and you want to start to integrate bits of JavaScript interactivity, Vue is really good at that. Um, the same can't be said for other frameworks like, for example, Angular. Angular is much more designed in mind where you're starting the application in Angular and you're building up uh, from there. It's not designed to be sprinkled into an existing site. All right, and then finally, when it comes down to performance, every framework out there is definitely thinking about optimization and trying to be as performant as possible. And Vue.js is no exception. Uh, one of the nice things about Vue is it's designed where it has like the core framework and then if you need to pull on additional features, such as things like I mentioned here, routing, state management, all these things we'll talk about later in this series, um, you can pull them in as you need them, right? So you don't necessarily have to pull in this large monolithic framework just to start with the basics. You can start with the core and kind of expand from there. And all of those things are going to help with uh, performance. So like I said, those are just a few selling points and reasons uh, some people choose and prefer to work with Vue.js. But form your own opinions. Uh, perhaps as you go through the series, periodically check in on the documentation on some of the other frameworks just to see how what we're doing in Vue.js, how it compares to those other frameworks. 
Uh, ask around to colleagues. What is their personal opinion? Look at job listings. That'll give you a sense of like the popularity of different frameworks if you're looking uh, or thinking about these things in terms of marketability as a developer. Like I said, there's so many factors involved. Not aiming to tackle that and make that argument here. If you're watching this series, I'm already assuming that uh, for whatever reason, you have decided to invest time in learning Vue.js. And so I'm here to uh, guide you on that journey. And with that, that concludes my introduction. And so we're ready for the next steps in this journey. Uh, in part two of this series, we're going to roll up our sleeves and start to code and work with Vue.js.